Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. The war in Afghanistan, a bad time for Canada to pull out, says the chairman of Caldwell Financial. A new poll saying Canadians are backing public sector cuts to fight the deficit. And can euthanasia be justified in some cases? Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. The war in Afghanistan. Should Canada retreat as planned next year? Not a good idea, according to Thomas Caldwell, chairman of Caldwell Financial. Caldwell says we're in a world war, our troops are on top of their game, and we have an obligation to provide support. According to a Harris Decimal poll, Canadian values are shifting to the right and increasingly embracing traditionally conservative values relating to family life and role of government. And Francine Lalonde's private member's bill to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide is back in Parliament. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Stuart Parker is a lecturer at U of T and co-founder of the Toronto Democracy Initiative. And Dr. Jamie Glazov is managing editor for Front Page Magazine. And you, the viewer, are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time with any of your comments about any one of the subject matters we're addressing today. And don't be shy about it. We'd love to hear from you. Take a look at the first one on your screen. Now, according to this article, as you can see, Thomas Caldwell, not the time to retreat. This is a very controversial topic. Should we be in Afghanistan in the first place? Some say no. Others, well, like Caldwell say, not only should we be in Afghanistan, but our promise to get out of there by the year 2011, he's saying, is a bad idea. And I touched on it already. He's saying, at this point, hey, we're doing well, our troops. And it, it's not a good idea to take off and leave the rest to fight it. But a point he makes in this article, he gives a long-term perspective, goes back to the Middle Ages and says, look, if you look back then, it was a war on, well religious extremism, if you put it that way, and that war spanned something like a hundred years. He's saying whether or not we want to accept it, we're actually in a world war now, and now is not the time to leave. So we want to know what our viewers think about this, and as well, our panelists. And I'm going to start with you on this one, Dr. Glazov. Um, I've become, I, I can't help from having become a bit jaded and uh, cynical on, on all of this, especially with Obama in power, Christine and Stu. Uh, you know, the way also, in the, even in the mainstream media, and the way the, especially the liberal left is discussing this conflict in general, it's almost as if, you know, you know, should I have strawberry ice cream or should I have chocolate ice cream tonight? You know, do I go to Paris or do I go to England for the summer? Do we stay in Afghanistan or do we leave? You know, we're in a war. There, there is an ideology and a force called radical Islam that has declared war on the West. We have jihadists, thousands, tens of thousands of them that, that are pursuing a certain totalitarian ideology that want to destroy the West. Afghanistan is the front. This is one of the main fronts of the terror war. If you read the transcripts, if you, hear, if you, if you, if you want to educate yourself to the dialogues that are happening between the leaders of the jihadi movements, of Al-Qaeda, this war will be won or lost in Afghanistan as well as in Iraq. And for us to abandon Afghanistan right now, no matter how long it takes, this isn't just uh, some kind of a little uh, expedition we're on and then we can just leave. We have to stay there and if it takes five years or 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, we are in a conflict. This is civilization versus barbarism and we have to stick this out as long as it takes. Okay, Stuart. Uh, now, I have to say, I'm not a person who says we should never have gone to Afghanistan. I supported the original Afghani war. I support the agreement that we made with NATO to pull our combat troops out at this time. But ultimately, I don't think that the solution is a simple withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think it's very important to keep Kabul as a free, pluralistic city. I think that's achievable. I think what worries me is that mm -hmm. the war that's going on in the countryside is 
producing a net increase in the number of people subscribing to the very ideology that we're fighting. And that's because most people who are motivated to join the Taliban or to get involved in this conflict are motivated out of a culture of vengeance and honor. A family member dies in their extended lineage and this mobilizes a new family group into the conflict uh, and so ultimately, as the war fans out into Pakistan, as the war continues mm -hmm. in the Afghani countryside, the number of individual family and tribal groups that are now aligning with our opponents is actually increasing. The goal has got to be to win. And I don't see continuing the current strategy as producing that outcome. Okay, so okay. Stu, uh, no, absolutely. So if this is a, this is not a discussion about ultimate uh, the ultimate outcome and what we need to do. This is a discussion about strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And absolutely, some of the things you're pointing to, we're we're in a very complex war. Uh, let's. I think we can definitely agree on one thing: the disaster of the Obama administration, for Obama to come forward and say, we are going to leave at this particular time. And this is what he's done. This is basically telling the Taliban, let's sit and duck, let's hide for a while. He's given a date. And then when that date comes, we're just going to come back. The leader of the free world, a nation that's leading the free world, cannot behave like this in the international community. And I, I can't believe we've come to this, but now Canada is the country that's going to have to stand up of the Obama administration can't even pursue a proper uh, policy on this. Now, for you well, watching, Thomas Caldwell is also the director for the Conference of Defense Association Institute. That's important to understand as well. And he is going so far as to say that, like it or not, we're in a world war. We want to know what your thoughts are, because I know that people can get pretty emotional about this. You've got people saying that, look, we actually made the Taliban. And this goes back historically into the situation when Russia was in Afghanistan um, fighting against the Mujahideen and the United States, Saudi Arabia, other nations got together and fought that effort. And from the Mujahideen came the Taliban. How do you respond to this, Jamie? Uh, um, sorry, because I'm speaking twice in a row here, so I'll... I'll try to be very quick. First of all, that's a historical inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. there, uh, there's people that argue that somehow the Reagan administration created the Taliban. It's much more complicated. The Reagan administration uh, supported a lot of forces, but there were f forces among there that they did not support. Look, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Soviet brutality in Afghanistan is what triggered all of this in the first place. They caused this Islamic backlash. And I'll just say another thing. The United States can can't operate with a crystal ball. Nobody's able to see the future. The United States had an enemy during the Cold War. Yes. It was the evil empire, the Soviet regime, one of the most evil regimes in world history. And sometimes you have to, so you, 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 can't, you don't just have angels in a war. There are some forces that you sometimes have to support that perhaps are not angelic or, or can be canonized for sainthood. And so these are some of the difficult decisions that had to be made during that time. But it was in Afghanistan it was a very serious factor there, and the Reagan administration can be credited because we defeated the Soviet Union uh, to a certain degree with supporting freedom fighters uh, during that time. Yes, it's unfortunate that out of that conflict also grew uh, a radical Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, Stuart, you're saying something interesting here, that we need to change strategy. We're yeah, looking at getting out of there in 2011. We're, thinking, we're looking at the agreement we've made with NATO yes. was that we pull our combat troops out in 2011, that perhaps they'll return at a later date, and that we're going to leave some kind of personnel there. I don't know the details of the personnel mm -hmm. that are being left. I think, though, that if Canada is leaving any personnel there, the focus has got to be uh, has got to be securing market access for people who are in agricultural production in Afghanistan. I think there were some really good opinions coming out of the Canadian military and elsewhere a few years ago looking at how we could have become an opium importer rather than destroying those crops and using those in place of manufactured pharmaceuticals that we pay a lot of money for right now, the synthetic opiates that we buy. I think that there are productive things to do. I think the key thing, though, is that we've got to get out of this cycle because what's happened is we've been pulled into a cycle that has been going on in Afghanistan since before Islam arrived. 
It's a cycle of kin slaying and vendettas and vengeance that comes out of a tribal society that is only nominally Muslim in many cases. There are long-term vendettas between family groups and between tribal groups. And what's happened is we've become actors in that. And these groups are in many cases because they perceive America or Canada or some very general foreign power as having injured or killed a member of their family group or destroyed their property. So you're saying they they're now reacting engage defensively? In a vendetta. Are you no, saying no, they're I'm reacting? not saying they're reacting okay. de defensively. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is that vengeance is a multi generational business in rural Afghanistan. And irrespective of ideology, the more people you create in Afghanistan who have vendettas against you, that's not just somebody in the present who doesn't like you, that's their children and their children's children. The big and, issue and, and, is, you know, what do you do about the Taliban? Hang on a second there, I'm gonna to go to Angela on line one. Hello Angela, you're on the line. Let's go to James on line four. Hello James, you're on the line. Hello. Yes, go ahead James. Oh hi. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful program and uh, very, very topical right now. But I'd, I'd like to... Uh, oh, hi. Uh, the, the, I'd like to say that... The, yeah. Hi. James, listen into the phone, not the television. We're on a delay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> he keeps talking to somebody. Uh, is. I'll tell you what. We're going to go for a break first. We'll be back after this. <laughs> Don't go away. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line, continuing to talk Why? about the war in Afghanistan. Do you think Canada should remain in Afghanistan beyond the 2011 deadline where we're saying we're going to be out of there? Let's go now to James again on line four. Hello, James. You're on the line. Oh, hi. Uh, I've worked in the Middle East for 12 years and have a good insight into the way the, the people in those regions think and behave. Canada is wasting its time in Afghanistan, and so are the NATO forces. You cannot change the thinking of the Taliban by going in there with force. It's going to take a long, long time for them to change. They are evolving, but it's going to take a very long time to change. And the sooner the West gets out of that region, the better for all of us. James, I want to know your thought on this, okay, because the Taliban is known to be very aggressive. Afghanistan, as stipulated by Dr. Glazov here, is Afghanistan is, is a huge front on the war against terror. And the Taliban is very aggressive in its approach of jihad by the sword. So how would you propose to deal with the Taliban? It has got to be dealt with on a more uh, conciliatory basis because their, their understanding of the way of life that they lead is totally different to what we, are, we know here in the West. We know that our way of life is, is great, but they don't see it that way. And unfortunately, looking at, looking at the West from the eyes of someone who is a Taliban, it, it, it's crazy. You, you can't solve it like that. It's got to be done in a very gradual and a very understanding way. You James, I want to thank you for your call because what I'm hearing here is that James is talking about conciliation. But when we're dealing with the Taliban here, you're dealing with a very aggressive force that's out to control. How do you okay. deal? Okay, yes, go ahead, both of you. Okay, first Let's of all, just even you. the yeah. assumption here of, of uh, the, the, the very premise of what James is saying is that we have some kind of a duty to, to make people understand or to come to terms. Uh, listen, there was, the military action did achieve something. The Taliban was in power and it gave sanctuary and it gave a safety and, and they hosted terrorist groups that perpetrated 9-11. So guess what? Guess what military action did? It, got, it, it dislodged the Taliban, and those terrorist camps had to go. So if James had proposed what he's proposing, there would have been another seven or eight 9-11s because those terrorist bases would have remained under the Taliban. So it was legitimate to overthrow the Taliban, and thank God that Bush did it, and we can't let them get back in power. Another You're thing. You're telling me that one they're second, not One second. Let me tell you something. You know, what's happening? you know what was happening under the Taliban? You know the pregnant women, when they were giving birth, no anesthetic. 
just Caesareans, split right open. You want me to go into more detail about how women are treated under the Taliban? We don't negotiate with people like this. If they don't want to understand that women are human beings and not cattle, then you go in and you militar militarily dislodge people like that and you don't come to terms with them and you, you basically go to war with them if they can't treat women or, or uh, minorities in a respectful way or if they're going to perpetrate jihad against the West. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, though, that the idea that there are not seven or eight places that one could safely base mm -hmm. terrorists today, I think is, uh, is a, I, I wouldn't go along with that. I think that there are places where terrorists continue to be able to be based in both Afghanistan and Pakistan and elsewhere in the world where governments are doing so a little more yeah, covertly and not thumbing hiding, their nose at us. So the reality hiding. is that we have not solved that particular problem. The reason there hasn't been another 9-11 is not because there, are, there aren't terrorist bases that can function. Wait the minute, people who minute, perpetrated that attack, difficult. the people who perpetrated that attack did not need a base in Afghanistan to do that. Wait a minute, wait a minute, mm -hmm. wait a minute, Stu, that, that's, all, that's all theory. They had a base in Afghanistan. That's where Al-Qaeda's training camps existed under the watchful eye and thumbs up of the Taliban. Absolutely. Okay, and that's why they went in there and, and got rid and, of them. And, 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 and Bush was right that you're going to have to run and you're going to have to hide and we got to keep them on the defensive. Well, what are you saying? You're basically saying, well, then but there's the always going to be, but there's always going to be okay, standards. Stop. Stuart, do you believe, Stuart, Stuart, Stuart do you believe we could negotiate? Negotiate with years. the Taliban. Do you believe we could negotiate with the Taliban? Not with their leadership, but with the warlords that back them, because these warlords are generally people who are looking to get ahead. They're generally people who make money off war, who make money off corruption. The war Afghanistan is two coalitions of warlords. One coalition of warlords is led by the Taliban. One coalition of warlords is led by the government that uh, listen, we back. So okay, we've we got to get to the bottom here. There are those that compare this war on terror with World War II against the Nazis. Do you see that similarity at all? No, I don't. You, I think that both sides are really evil. I'll, I'll agree that both the Nazis and the Taliban are evil okay, incarnate. Okay. But I don't think that. But I think the similarity pretty much stops there. Okay. What about I you, Jamie? Well, I don't know how. First of all, I don't know how the similarity stops there when the Nazis uh, played a significant role in building up the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1920s. So, if you want a history lesson on that, we can meet maybe sometime on the weekend. I got a little bit of free time. Okay. Now we'll time. go to the phone but lines. Anyway, yes. Go well, ahead. You, you cannot appease mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. And Chamberlain tried it. They tried it with Hitler. They tried it with the Nazis. We don't come to terms with the Taliban. We don't come to terms with Al Qaeda. We don't come to terms with people that hate liberty, that think women are cattle, and that want totalitarianism. If we have to fight them for a hundred years, we do. So all of the people that we did come to terms with in order to win the Cold War, people like Saddam Hussein, those were all mistakes. I'm not really all sure. of those things that we did, all the terrible deals we made with dictators in order to win the Cold War, well, those were all wrong. Wait a minute. I'm not saying that we don't pursue a strategy. You're saying that we have to pursue a strategy in Afghanistan where we have to deal with certain forces to, des to destroy a greater evil. That's I don't right. necessarily disagree with that. But wait a minute. I want to say before we go, Stu made a very important mm -hmm. point in terms of the importance of diplomacy and strategy. Yes. Let's say this, at least for the Canadian troops out there, and what great research packages, by the way, you guys give for us to read because one of those stories in there said that among the polls taken with the Afghan people, Canadian troops are more popular, vastly more popular than, than the Af than yeah. Afghanistani mm -hmm. politicians themselves. And Stu, you got to admit, for Canadians to be that popular in Afghanistan, it says a lot for our troops and for Canadians. That was one of the reasons here. given. That was no, one of the reasons like given I, by I, Caldwell I, I, as I well, that we have when, respect. I Listen, guys, that we have good. respect <laughs> in Afghanistan and that that puts Canada in a unique role to play there. Let's go now to Eldin on line seven. Hello, Eldin. You're on the line. Uh... I'm just making a comment, really. I've been watching this war uh, from one side to the other, and I don't believe this war is winnable in any any sense of the word. You, can, you cannot win it. We don't know how to win it. Our leaders don't know how to how to fight it. it uh, the Taliban, the Al Qaeda, the terrorists, whatever, fight from the basis of the Koran, which. Uh, uh, preaches that we show your infidels and should be done away with, killed, or however. Uh, to, to to fight 
these here are we should go back to the Bible because we are fighting the Koran. The Bible gives in the Old Testament God gave man the the rule the laws or the rules or the directions to the Jew how to fight these people. He said we should go in and kill man, woman and child and leave nothing living. He said, if you do, he said, they will come back like a uh, uh, swarm of hornets or so in the Bible. Alton, I want to thank you for calling in. I, I want to put this question to the two of you. The biggest point that Eldon made there was, this is a war that we can't win. I've interviewed people on the line here that talked about, this is a war we definitely can't win. But the point is, one good point that Caldwell brought out was, well, a hundred years, he said, in the Middle Ages. And his belief is, we're in a world war, like it or not. Although it may not be winnable now, this is something for our way of life we need to continue. Eldon made a point when he said it's not winnable. There are those who say it may not be winnable, but we need to constantly push back the threat, as we did with the Mujahideen. How do you respond to that? I think that... Um it's about, you can always find a way to take a war that you think you've won and say you've lost because you've established ridiculous victory conditions. And it depends what victory conditions we establish. I think that there are ways in which we can make Afghanistan a better place. I continue to believe that. I think there are ways in which we can reduce the support for jihadist movements. I believe we can do that. I believe those things are achievable. What I don't believe is that a practice of, of increasing the number of lineage groups and tribal groups that hate us in Afghanistan and Pakistan is the way to do that. So I absolutely, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm also concerned though by some of the uh, comments that, uh, that Eldon made. I think it is crucially important that we not take many of the warlords who back the Taliban and even dignify their agenda as based on the Quran. The reality is that Afghanistan is not a very literate society. Mm -hmm. These are not especially orthodox Muslims, and in many cases, these are opportunists who are growing fat on the spoils of war. Hmm. Jamie. I will say to follow up on that, that the Democratic Party and the left was screaming and yelling that the Iraq war was unwinnable, that Iraq mm -hmm. had been lost, and it's incredible that when we look today, we know that Al-Qaeda's Al back was broken by the American military, and thank God for General Petraeus and his strategy uh, that achieved a lot of victory there at the moment, and uh, Iraq is moving uh, into, uh, into a civil uh, society and civil democracy. Even uh, Al-Qaeda transcripts are now saying that they've got to go elsewhere to fight jihad, that the battle there has been lost. So, you know, a lot of these defeatists, and, and especially on the left, they say that these wars are unwinnable. They're only saying that because they want to see the, the security of the Western world and of the United States to be hurt. As you said, Christine, earlier on, uh, or alluded to, uh, whether things can be won overnight or not is not the issue. The issue is there are some wars, like with Nazi Germany, like with the Soviet Union in terms of the Cold War, that have to be fought. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what Stu is alluding to also is, of course, strategy is very important, and a strategy can either win or lose a war. Here's a concern in food for thought. We live in a society, an, an admirable one, most of you out there have no idea what the Taliban thinks like, what these other sinister forces think like. We thrive on negotiations. And my question to you, do you believe that the Taliban is a force that we could negotiate with? We're going to go for a break. We'll be back after this. Don't go away. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line, continuing to talk about would you like to see us stay in Afghanistan? Let's go now to Don on line four. Hello Don, you're on the line. No, I wouldn't want to see us stay. We, uh, Canadian government said 2011 be the maximum. I think we've done our share there. A lot of Canadians, our Canadian soldiers have been killed there and it's unwinnable as far as I'm concerned because surrounded by millions of uh, 
militant Muslims, and you, uh, they just keep pouring them in. And life don't seem to mean nothing to them. Whereas, Don, like, you got that right. Life means nothing to them. But do you believe that the entire NATO should leave Afghanistan, or is it just Canada I mean, you're advocating for? Christine. The Taliban. Do you believe that all of NATO should pull out, Don, or just Canada? Well, I guess it's up to the individual country. Uh, all right, but the... Uh, I uh, think probably they all should leave and be unfortunate for the pe people that's left there, though, because uh, one of the other speakers there has said the, they consider women as cattle. There's nothing mm -hmm. and the freedom. Okay. Don, I'm glad you called in. The point that Don made here is it's not worth, it's not worth the lives of the NATO troops, particularly Don living in Canada, of Canadian troops. Let them deal with their own problems. If the women are treated that way, that's their business. And I've heard that before. But the biggest question I have for the two of you is, is this. So we leave the Taliban. Do you believe they're going to keep it in Afghanistan? That's a big question. Take it away. Well, both our current strategy and simply letting the Taliban retake power will both are both going to produce an expansion of the conflict, and that's, right? And that's the that issue. has already happened. Be yes. You know, our strategy in part made it rational for the Taliban to use more Pakistani territory and other surrounding territory. So, yes, no, the, the territory surrounding Afghanistan is in the game now. That is yeah. irreversible. Pakistan's it's one a of huge the reasons player. I agreed with Obama during the 2008 election where he said you can't talk about this without involving Pakistan. Pakistan is already involved. And I think that that was a move forward in understanding the kind of conflict that is now going on. I don't like the idea of abandoning people. I think what we need to do is make sure that Kabul is a place that people can <coughs> safely get to and that remains a pluralistic city. I don't think it's reasonable to hold on to all that countryside, but I think that we can be committed to holding on to areas that can be maintained as actual functioning Interesting pluralistic bit of information. Centers. When Obama first came into power, and sadly enough, this was on the back pages, I guess following Bush, we understand why, given the, the press that Bush was given. But Obama, one of the first things he did when he came into power, he was striking Taliban targets in Pakistan. Just a, word, just a word there I thought I'd mention. Go ahead, Jamie. No, absolutely. And uh, a lot of the bases are in Pakistan, and that's one of the few things that Obama's doing right, uh, is that they have to go into Pakistan and uh, dislodge, because that's where a lot of the cancer is mm -hmm. located. Yeah. Okay, let's go now to Dave on line 8. Hello, Dave. You're on the line. Uh, hello. Hi, Dave. Am I on? Yes, you are. Hi. I, I'd just like to say I really agree with Dr. Jamie Glazoff. Because uh, I don't think Canada should pull out in 2011. Uh, I think there's, there's way too much work needs to be done. And, and now that he just told us they're killing babies in hospitals, you know, what else do we have to expect? They throw acid in girls' faces. And what about the insurgents? How come the insurgents hasn't kicked in yet? Hmm. Just a sec, I just yes. want to uh, thank you very much for that support. Stu, do you notice that people call and support me and not you so far? I think that's very uh, telling yeah. about I how think, the show is I going. I think uh, oh, I <laughs> may also be telling <laughs> about CTS's audience. No, no, wait a minute. <laughs> to be fair, no, <laughs> to be fair to Most Stu. of the comments have said that they support Glazoff. Okay, wait a minute. I just want to say <laughs> Hey, that, some uh, said we should pull out, okay? <laughs> that, uh, what, what, what I mentioned there earlier is that uh, we know how women are, were treated under the Taliban and continue to be treated. What I was saying is under that regime of the Taliban, uh, one of the things they were doing was performing cesareans on women without anesthetic uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on women. And we can go into a million other uh, injustices perpetrated against women there. Um, yeah, so we, we can move on. I, I think we agree. We're just talking also about strategy, obviously, and how, and, and Stu is bringing up, I'm not sure if I agree completely on, on everything, but he's saying it's very important to win the loyalty of the populace. Yeah, so what are you saying about our audience there, Stuart? What are you saying? <laughs> Yeah, you said something. You said something about CTS. What yeah, did you say? Yeah, what was that all about? Say it again. Uh, mostly, it's uh, yeah, conservative. I, I, I was, I was just assuming that, that, that CTS is probably, probably <laughs> not drawing heavily from uh, my uh, my former political party base, which is, which is the what? NDP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Will you admit that I argued so effectively on the last show that you were somewhat convinced on a few levels, and it has motivated your shift to the right? Yeah, a little bit of a degree. shift to the right. You know, there's yeah. thoughts I, I about. I haven't, I haven't shifted to the right. I've been kicked topic. to the right. I've been yeah. kicked hey, to the right. Maybe a lot of Canadians have, yeah. according to this survey that we'll yeah. be talking about soon. I think if Stu I reads my book, we're going to see a major transformation. Okay, Stu, you got a project here. Let's go now to Leo on line seven. Hello, Leo. You're on the line. Hello. Go ahead, Leo. Okay, I think that we can never give up on the Taliban, ever. I mean, uh, if Afghan falls, who, what country is next if we pull out? I mean, Jamie's talked about history. The last time Islam started a major war with Christianity, it was only until two-thirds of the Christian world was gone before the Crusades started. And if we, and, and if we don't stand up now, when are we going to stand up? Thank you for calling in, Leo. We have Jamie. To, we, we have to remember, a absolutely great point, but we mm -hmm. have to, this is, this is crucial, that when the, when the Soviet regime fell, when Gorbachev moved those troops out of Afghanistan, we know that militant Islam, the jihadists there, were emboldened. They saw that yes. as a huge victory. It is crucial not to give them this ideal, not just military victory, but a ideological victory where jihadists all over the world will be emboldened if they see a Western defeat in Afghanistan. Okay. Okay, let's go now to Ivan on line eight. Hello, Ivan. You're up, you're on the line. Hi. Good afternoon. It's uh, I just like to say why why would you want to pull out of Afghanistan? You know, there's the war on drugs that's going on, and uh, you know, we're not pulling out of there anytime soon. So I think the terrorism front is something that we should uh, continue to battle. Thanks for calling in, Ivan. Uh, I go just ahead. have to say, I think that it, adding the drug war to our Afghan strategy is one of the biggest disasters of the war in Afghanistan. The decision to take the most lucrative cash crop in Afghanistan and destroy it rather than importing it has set us back perhaps, uh, I mean, who knows how long. You just said, what I do you mean importing it? What do you mean importing it? You mean taking I, I, it? I, I, mean, I mean becoming an importer of, Afghan, it into a of Afghan opium to replace the synthetic wait opiates minute, so that the Canadian healthcare oh, system, minute, you are Canadian healthcare system pays a fortune for synthetic opiates. Wait, but you are aware that this opium is funding the Taliban, right? No, it's funding both sides. Both, uh, because the decision to grow poppies, the decision mm -hmm. to grow poppies is made by farmers going, what can I sell? It's not made by some guy at the head of the Taliban going, you're going to grow poppies here. The reality is that people were growing a crop that they thought they could get money for. The Taliban was willing to do business with them. We were not. What a surprise. We wreck their crops. They go to the Taliban. Okay, you know what? We, we can uh, argue about all these different strategies. Uh, one thing is for sure that, that this opium uh, played a large role in, in funding terrorism. The bottom line is we cannot allow the Taliban to take control of Afghanistan again and to have training camps there for terrorists where terrorists can comfortably live in a country and, and perpetrate more 9-11s. We have to keep them on the run. We cannot evacuate from Afghanistan for that very reason. Okay, let's go now to Isiwi on line 7. Hello, you're on the line. Yes, hi. Hello. Actually, no, I think the Canadian forces uh, should pull out. And the, uh, after nine years, after nine years of, uh, you know, running the war in Afghanistan, what have you achieved? Plus, uh, the native forces are not fighting the Taliban. They are fighting the whole Bashtun tribe, the whole country, and other two joined. So this is a matter of, you know, wasting our time and changing the vocabulary, as Mr. James is saying. I don't agree with him at all. And somebody said this, this is a, a clash of civilizations. And, clash you know, of civilizations. Jamie, your reaction to that? A clash of civilizations. Uh, That's critical. Wait a minute. He's saying it is or he's disagreeing that I said it is? I, is he I we? I, I think You're I, saying I, it's I a clash same, of civilizations. Sorry. I missed it. So anyway, well, the bottom line okay. is, is that there is a clash. And, and, and you know what? This is a saying that's used, the clash of civilizations. But I will just say that in a lot of ways it's not. Um, and Wafa Sultan, great hero, made a great point on this. Yes. Civilizations compete. Civilizations, if we use that word, are humane and compassionate. This is a clash of civilization and barbarity. And we you have know, to Wafa keep this Sultan, I, I, I got to mention her. I, Part of me is even sorry you brought that up because I met this lady. 
yeah. couple of weeks She's ago. A great I met hero. her. I spoke to her one on one. She's appeared on Al Jazeera. She's yeah. appeared on CNN. She's a great hero. This this woman talks about because she's spoken out against Islam. She did the forbidden in Islam and spoke out against Muhammad. That is the one thing she did. This woman has to constantly move from place to place because she's being threatened. Her life is being threatened. Her, ch her child's life is being threatened. And this is how she has to live no matter where she goes in this world. I, it was heartbreaking talking to this woman. Yeah. If you just, many of you no. don't get that chance. I did. No, she's a great hero, yes. but the point I was, she's a great hero, one of the great heroes in, in, in the world today and in, in, the, in the culture, war, in the terror, terror war as well as culture war. I was just saying that she made a great point that even this term, uh, clash of civilizations, if we really want to analyze it, we have on the one side a civilization and on the other side a barbarous force that wants to impose uh, a fascistic society on human beings. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even sure that I think we're attributing to the Taliban a coherence beyond, the, beyond simple hate. I think that the Taliban is a horrible movement and it is defeatable. I just want to make the point, though, that sometimes, Christine, you, you move into using the term Islam a little more expansively than I think is advisable. The reality is that some of the greatest... Um, Islamic poetry of the Middle Ages did play around with when, Muhammad. We're not criticizing and, Islam. And, and, and so I just Islamism. want to make very clear. Islamism. I, I, I want to make that make very, clear. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Just a sec, I just, just, just want to say yeah. that, that it's important to recognize that it's not a universal value, that the prophet is absolutely untouchable under all circumstances. And so we don't, uh, we don't want to go too far. Okay, just a sec, just a sec, just a sec, Stu. What I would correct there is mm -hmm. what I think Christine uh, was doing is advisable in the sense that there has to be a, a truth stated in, in this terror war today. And Christine was alluding to it, and, and, and I give her propers for it in the sense that these terrorists quote verses, these terrorists quote and rely on theological teachings, and these theological teachings come from theological texts, and these texts are in the Quran and in Islamic I, I just want to give an example. And we have to be honest about that, mm -hmm. and there's many brave we Muslims that we know, like Tariq Fatah and Irshad Manji. We can name many, many brave Muslim reformers today that are trying to bring Islam into the democratic and modern world, but we cannot do this if we are not honest about what uh, the Quran teaches in several parts of its theology. Uh, okay, can you hang on a second? Some, something before not. we go for a break that we need to be honest about. I'm a Christian. I don't like things to be said insulting about Christ, but I'm not going to kill anybody if it's said. I, it's insulting. I don't think people should be saying something negative about a deity that people worship, but people say things about Christ. They don't need to be in danger for their lives. People come out, like those cartoons, they publish it, their lives are in danger. Should it be published is another conversation altogether in terms of respect for one's faith. That's another story. But to, for one's life to be in danger because of that brand of Islam, it's a source of serious but concern. Wait, yeah, and this just, is just what the second. Taliban well, wait a minute, represents. Wait, but Christine, what we... A statement here yes. that the Quran contains hateful things that can be excerpted. This is true of every holy We're book. We're talking about the Taliban here. Wait a minute, Stu. No, 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 Stu. This and is I a no, 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 wait, Stu. Christian, no, 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 Stu. This is I a can take the verse Stu. out of Leviticus no. telling me to kill homosexuals. No, excuse me, excuse me. And that's Stu. not a problem Stu. with the Stu. Bible. You know what? That's I'm a problem sick. with a movement. Take it out no, of Christianity. No, 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 Stu. Stu, wait a minute. No, Stu, wait a minute. And 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 no matter how many times this is said, this lie continues to be perpetrated. There is nothing in the Old Testament, and there is nothing in the New Testament that teaches global. Jihad against unbelievers. And in the Old Testament, that violence is is it's it's descriptive and not prescriptive. I am forced there is to go nothing for a break. in the I'm New Testament. The no, but away. there is nothing about Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're going to go to you waiting on the phone lines before we go on to another subject matter now. We, we probably won't respond, but we want to hear what your thoughts are. Let's go now to Joan, Joanne on line four. Hello, Joanne. You're on the line. Hi. I just wanted to say that um, as long as there is oppression, there will be the fight for freedom. It is right and it is the only choice that we have because when a 
oppression, when people oppress other people or whatever, they would take over too if they could. Joanne, I want to thank you for calling in and expressing your point of view. Let's go now to Rick on line seven. Hello, Rick. You're on the line. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just wanted to say this goes back to um, early Greece, ancient history. Do we fight for freedom of choice or do we cave in to rule? Okay, Rick, thank you so much for calling in. Now, with the time that we have left, and of course, much of our pace is driven by you calling in. Your calls are very important to us. So we tarried on that first subject matter. But the second one that we have is one of interest, and this was according to a Harris Decimal Poll. There you have it on your screen, Canadian values shifting to the right. This is what the poll suggests, that according to this poll, that people are starting to adopt, according to what I'm reading here, to embrace conservative values like family, quote, the definition of marriage, and that quote again, abortion is morally wrong. This is what this article is suggesting here. On another note though, there is a part that's added on to this, that people by and large are losing faith in government. That it's come to the point where we're believing more in private enterprise and counting on ourselves, our families, to do the business as opposed to bigger government, yeah. which is traditionally a more conservative view. So you can't help but wonder if there's some kind of a relationship there. Do you believe that but Christine, we're shifting to the right? But Christine, yeah. the one part that I wish you had read there to the viewers is where the Canadians that were polled are moving to the right, where they were saying that watching CTS and listening to Dr. Jamie Glazov. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I've had quite a substantial no, we had to no wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> i've had a substantial influence on the movement to conservative values from people watching cts okay I, okay okay Absolutely. fine you're going fine. out on you're a doing high doing note <laughs> you're heading down to california the yeah, belly but, of the beast and you're going to take it on there you had a bit of a personal shift haven't you had a bit of a personal shift i haven't i haven't i haven't moved to the right i was thrown out of the ndp for accusing it of having done right wing things uh, oh is that why so, yeah no i um but just just to uh, what kind of right wing things Oh, yeah. I, I was like talking... Like abandoning I, socialism? No, what kind um, of I was... Uh uh, their uh, decision, uh, it was a set of government policies they had in the 1990s in BC. It involved okay. uh, um, really hideous uh, policies like prohibiting well refugees both from working and oh. getting social assistance. Uh, so, so do you think any society case, should be moving towards free enterprise or back to socialism that's yeah. been back completely to socialism. discredited? Back to socialism. Completely back, discredited. We've never been there. But, uh, <laughs> the true socialism hasn't been tried yet? Is that one of your uh, theories? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not a Trotskyite, if that's what you mean. I'm just saying that the good thing about this poll is that it still says that um, a majority of Canadians mm -hmm. um, favor the kind of social contract that we have today that yes there's a the, the size of the minority the, the that government the has a role of the minority but the size of yeah. the minority that opposes abortion has grown a little bit but the majority of canadians remain pro choice there are, this 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 shows trends that i don't think are great trends for canadian society but it doesn't show that these that this has happened but a huge point it's is made about bigger government a potential <laughs> a huge point um, is made about government though and, and what it says is that, that the majority of canadians listen. believe that govern uh, that the government has a key has role a to role, play a in role. Managing but the economy. what role but a to what role. extent Yes, go ahead, Jamie. Well, I don't know. I think the Canadians, in terms of the first half of, of what we're discussing here, uh, understand reality, and that is that free enterprise is the wave of the future, uh, that the government should uh, have a role, but a limited role, because the government, in general, should never be doing for, for people what they should be doing for themselves. And the more freedom you give to an economy, the more economic growth will be. I think conservative principles overall have been legitimized over this entire era, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, so, why is it then that our much more regulated economy did so much better in the in the 2008-2009 crash? It seems to me that even our
conservative prime minister is going around saying, That's you know what the problem point. is? You know, Stephen Harper's on CNN saying, if you had regulated your financial sector course, as tightly as Canada course, has, yeah. then, so I don't think we of can course, just say know. that He's the freer the economy is, the better it's going to go. It's a lot more complex spending than that. You have huge. to evaluate government policies based on how successful they are, not based on what ideology they're associated Absolutely. with. And you know how complicated it is. I agree with you. Of course, there's there has to be regulation, uh, but it's very interesting that in the, in, in the United mm -hmm. States throughout that whole crisis that they were giving things to people, things that people could not afford. And in many respects, that's also a socialist principle to be giving, you know, there has to be money to buy things. Uh, Stu, but overall, one thing I want to mention, and we're running out of time, one thing I've always been a little bit surprised about the left and about socialists in general, like Michael Moore making a movie about condemning capitalism, but yet benefiting from capitalism. Uh, social, or, you know, I would say people on the left like you that argue very much for redistribution of wealth, I've never really seen you redistribute your own wealth. <laughs> And how 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 kind it's, have you been to okay, me? Okay, let's be fair to Stuart. Let's be fair to Stuart here. Well, okay, Stuart, go ahead. We got no, well, you all there. Christine, have you not noticed okay, that leftists, over this way. leftists okay. never okay. distribute like their own wealth? And they I always, got my Andy here it is. tax receipt here. <laughs> but no, but Christine, isn't it true? Hey, the, he's ready to redistribute. The, okay, the, the, the he's left, putting his money where his mouth is. <laughs> Listen, the leftists always talk about redistribution of wealth. Never redistribute their own wealth, and it is a fact. I think that's a ridiculous cliche. Listen, if you want to read, no, it's not because. If you want to read, look, look, what do you mean? Look at the Soviet Union and every communist society, for instance, there's a nomenclatura that, a, that acquires wealth and there's always more poor people that don't get anything. And I'm saying that people like Michael Moore condemn capitalism and, and they're the greatest beneficiaries of it. And they're usually, the, they're usually the most selfish people. Uh, do you think people? Obama's principles um, have affected Canada in any way? We're seeing what's happening there. Absolutely. He's, you think taking, so? he's taking a set of ideas. We were, you know... Many Canadian leftists were conned into believing that Obama was somehow some kind of socialist. I guess we were believing Fox News or something. And then, of course, he enacts a set of policies. You got Jamie going there. <laughs> he enacts a set of policies that on climate, on income, on financial regulation that are so similar to our conservative government. Okay, the I have to be honest. I can't continue Harper sitting at a table and with somebody are criticizing the Fox News. Are the closest I, I, I hear in, um, nope, in opinion <laughs> of. Uh, of any two uh, leaders in the Americas right now. And so people are, people are looking at the accord between Obama and Harper and they're thinking, hmm, maybe these conservatives really are reasonable centrists. But the reality is that Obama's Obama's on the far... Obama's a big spender, though. Obama's on the... Harper and, has and Harper's spending. also a big spender. Oh, he's restricted Every spending. Every major conservative government in this, uh, in this country since 1984 has rung up massive deficits that they've left but the But if left you listen to, to the last back. budget, he restricted spending. Harper, he restricted oh, yeah. spending. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's still the biggest deficit we've ever had. Okay, just a second. It's the biggest deficit we've ever had. Period. Uh, Stu, I, I don't a carry know. over uh, first from previous all, okay, governments. First of all, uh, I have very difficult time sitting. You got at, a surplus. First of all, I have very difficult time sitting with anyone at the same table that even begins to hint at a criticism of Glenn Beck or O'Reilly. Okay, we're going to have to close on uh, that note here. That's I'm all the time we have. See you again next now. time. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, well, thank Glenn you for watching. Beck is a hero of